good morning everyone. It's Sunday morning and I just want to say hello to Sugar Tree Ridge and everybody watching online. Um, I had a sermon prepared last night that I worked on from number 17 and I might kind of put them both together today but as I was sleeping and I woke up I kind of felt like I should do a familiar portion of scripture like God laid on my heart to do the parable of the sower because it's very uh, applicable to our times. And so it's in uh, Mark chapter 4, we're going to read, it says, uh, Jesus began to teach again by the lake. I thought that was neat that he uh, taught again by the lake. must have been one of his favorite places to teach. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake. One of the things that you see uh, as Jesus is teaching, the crowd begins to grow. More people are coming around because of his teachings and his miracles. Uh, one point he has to get away from the crowd. Another point he says, get a boat ready for me in case I need it. And at this point, in chapter 4 of Mark, he has to get in the boat and push away from the shore. And I couldn't laugh, but to think that Jesus was the first one to try social distancing, which is applicable to our time. So we didn't invent that. It happened 2,000 years ago. So he got into the boat, and he went out a little way from the shore, and he began to teach people through parables. He says, listen, a farmer went out to sow seed, and as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the pathway, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil, and it sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and it withered because it had no root. Very, very significant uh, thought right there on that one. And then uh, verse 7, other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear any grain. Still another seed fell on good soil. It came up and grew and produced a crop, multiplying 30, 60, even 100 times. And Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. So this is very important for us to understand. He doesn't explain it right away. It's later that he sits down with the disciples and he actually explains the parable, what it means. And so in verse 13, he says, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. The word is the word of God. Some people are like the seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown to them. Others, like seed sown on rocky places, hear the word at once, receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seeds sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke out the word, making it unfruitful. But then there's others, like the seed sown in the good soil, that hear the word, accept it, produce a crop 30, 60, or even 100 times what was sown. That's the scripture for today. It's also in Matthew 13 and Luke 8. So it's in all three synoptic gospels, which means it's probably pretty important Important that we understand it. So the parable of the sower, one of the things to remember here is it doesn't say that this is the first time the sower ever sowed seed or the first time that those soils that he's speaking of ever heard the word of God. So it's quite possible they had heard the word many times before. But I wanted to look at the soils as an uh, applicant applicable to our specific situation during quarantine, coronavirus, a big change in life. And we have the word being sown, obviously the word of God, the word could be the preachers, teachers, and the first seed, the word falls on the pathway. You can't have a path unless it's been worn out. Uh, somebody's traveled that pathway many times, and uh, as you travel, the grass gets beat down, and you, begin, you get a path, and that path becomes hard. It says the evil one steals the word. And I believe there's a scripture that really defines what this pathway is. It's so they don't apply the word because, uh, and you see this as preachers very often, that tradition, many times, is something we always did, we've always done, and we're always going to do. Uh, we've never done it that way. Have you ever heard it? Preachers hear that all the time. People in a church hear that. And unfortunately, a lot of our young leaders who are trying to follow God and lead other churches here, well, we've never done it that way. These are people that are on the pathway. It's hard. Their heart is hard. They're set in their traditions. And Jesus talks about this in Mark chapter 7. Let me read that to you just briefly. Mark chapter 7, he discusses tradition. See, the disciples were eating great with unwashed hands. They were 
were hungry, they'd been traveling with Christ, and they were going through a grain field, and they were eating with unwashed hands. And the Jews became very restless, very upset, because they saw them doing this. And they said, how is it possible that your disciples can eat without ceremonially washing their hands? They don't, they're not holding to the tradition of the elders. Uh, they're not holding to the other traditions of washings of cups and pitchers. They're not holding the tradition of the unclean uh, hands. They're just not holding to the traditions that we have. And Jesus responds, you let go of the commands of God. And you are holding to the traditions of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own tradition. Keep going down. Verse 13 it says, thus you nullify the word of God by your own traditions that you have handed down. And you do many things like that. In other words, the word of God can't work in your situation. Or you're not following God properly because you've allowed tradition to rear its head over what the word of God might be doing. And this is a situation like that. How can we have church online? We always go to church. We go to a building. We've done it for years. It's our tradition. And we rarely take time to step back. And this is what we must do in this situation. As Christians, as believers, step back just for a moment and say, what is God actually doing in this situation? And uh, it's just like trying to do a Bible study here on the shores of this lake. The geese make noise, the wind makes noise, the people make noise, the cars make noise. And I can't help but think, what kind of noise was being made when Jesus was teaching on the shores of Galilee? That's where he taught quite often. He taught in a boat, he taught in Galilee, he taught around towns where there was a lot of commotion. And that's where we're at today. It's changed a little bit. It's not a little, no longer traditional. We should get back to that. But this pathway is a hardened, beaten down pathway. And I believe that refers to tradition, where we get so set in our ways that we, re we refuse, or we just, not, not probably ungodly way, but we just say, I don't want to do that because we've never done that. And, and so the Word of God never penetrates. It's never applied because tradition overrides what God is doing. Tradition overrides our free thought. And tradition will choke out a movement of the Holy Spirit. So the word never penetrates the pathway's heart. We're set in our ways. Um, we never stop to say or observe, okay, God, um, we're not in charge here. You are. Let's see what you're going to do in this situation. I would admit, when all this started and I saw churches closing, I thought, this is crazy. Why are we closing churches? God is more powerful than that. He can see beyond this disease. He can cure this disease. He can hold us uh, unaffected by this disease as his children. But really... Um, I had to take a minute and pray. And when we started praying and talking to the elders of our church, we said, um, let's see what God is doing in this situation. It's not traditional. It's unique. We're in a, we're in a unique time. And so this is going to build some character in some of us as we let go of the old traditions and do things a little differently. So that's where the word fell the first time. It fell on the pathway. And then it says it fell on rocky places. And it says trouble and persecution began to uh, steer people away from the word that they'd received. Uh, it choked it out. It, it didn't choke it out. It, it, it landed on rocky places, and that would represent hard times. When trouble or persecution came up, the people had no root. In other words, they hadn't been through a hard time. And um, I remember talking to a friend of mine, Gail Allen, who's a farmer out in Hillsboro, and he farms about 4,000 acres. And during one of the times when I first came to Hillsboro teaching, I remember uh, seeing some of the farms and how beautiful they were. And then there was a bad rainstorm and a windstorm and all the plants were uprooted. And I asked Gail, why does that happen? He said, because when the seeds were planted, the soil was very good. Water was easy to obtain, so the roots never went deep. They stayed along the surface where the water was. So then when the drought came and the winds came and all this adverse weather came, the plants were easily uprooted. This is from a very successful farmer he explained it to me and that's what christ is saying here uh because everything has been smooth and we're blessed in america by the way because everything's been smooth and everything's been very traditional and there hasn't been many adverse things that come against the church when things get shaken up the people with no root who haven't been through hard times fall away uh they get discouraged and so i wanted to take a look at that because 
you can think of a few things in the Bible that, that, that we can refer to. Um, obviously, in Numbers 17 and 16, where we were this week, the Israelites were going through some tough times, and they became disgruntled, and they grumbled, and they began to talk against God, and they let demonic projections come in their head, and they went against the man of God and the plan of God, because things weren't the way they used to be. And so, in Daniel chapter 3, we have something very similar, and I want to really grab onto this, all of us, really grab onto this. Daniel chapter 3, the Israelites have been captured. And the Hebrew children refused to bow to an idol that the king had placed up. And the king said to them, if you do not bow to my idol, then I will throw you in a furnace of fire. And I will heat it up seven times hotter than it was. And I will, I will murder you, basically. And what's neat was that happened. The Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow the knee to Nebuchadnezzar's idol. And they, uh, they, he, they were thrown in the furnace. And as the people were observing, even the soldiers that threw, threw them into the furnace uh, died because the fire was so hot. And they began to observe them. They watched these Hebrew children in the fire. They were bound. They were taped. They were in with their turbans. They were in with their clothes. And they were thrown into this fire. But this is something that they noticed. The king noticed. He looked and he said, wait a minute. Didn't we throw three people in that fire? But I see four people in that fire. And that showed that Jesus, and it is, it says the Lord was with them in the fire. What's neat about that is he didn't come get them out of the fire. He was in the fire with them as they walked around. So Jesus was in the fire. And when times are easy, we don't learn that Jesus is with us in the fire. If you look at the times in uh, Mark chapter 4 and Mark chapter 6, when the disciples were in the boat and the storms came up, Jesus never took them out of the storm. But he was in the storm with them. He calmed the storm, but he was in the storm. He was in the boat with them in the storm, and he was walking on the water when they were in the storm. What he was doing was putting them in adverse conditions, trying times, unusual times. And actually, if you look at the Sea of Galilee, I've studied it, um, the winds can kick up on there very quickly, and the waves can reach 8 to 10 feet very quickly. Um, that's what the, some of the research I have said. So this happened when they were on the boat, and Jesus didn't take them out of the boat. He got in the boat with them. He walked on the shore with them, and he was with them in adverse times, just like this wind. So I think I wanted to look at that because we're a trophy kid situation. Every kid gets a trophy, and that's okay, I guess, to a certain extent. But if you don't put children or churches, or families through some hard times. We don't grow very deep roots. We never learn how to deal with those hard times. We never learn to deal or know that Christ is with us in those hard times. And I think of soldiers. You don't just take a soldier from the living room and the next day throw him out in the, in the, on the front lines of the battlefield. What we normally do is put him through eight weeks of basic training, 10 weeks of uh, a job training. We put him through adverse training. And we try to pressure them, we try to break them so that when they get in stressful times, they're ready to handle the stressful times. The same with doctors who do internships, the same with lawyers who do mock trials where the, they try to really put pressure on them. The same with firemen. Um, they learn how to fight fires before they get into a real fire and they learn that their training will get them through. And that's what Jesus is teaching us, that in the hard times, he'll be with us as well. And so one of the unique things was in Mark chapter, or excuse me, Matthew chapter 11. Uh, I think this is pretty neat that we have to look at it. And uh, John the Baptist was thrown into prison by Herod for preaching the word of God. And he began to doubt. He began to have uh, wonder, why am I in prison? Why am I in this situation? He began to doubt that Jesus was even the Messiah. And so he sends two disciples to run to Jesus and say, are you the Messiah? Or should we look for another one? This is his first adverse time. He's in prison. And Jesus sends them back. He quotes to them the word of God from Isaiah 35, verses 5 and 6. And he says, tell John this, knowing that John would know this scripture, the lame walk, the leper is healed, the blind see, the sick and, and everybody are, are being healed, and the word of God is being preached. And said, take that to John and tell him, that everything's going to be okay I, and to prove that I'm the Messiah. So he's saying, I'm fulfilling Isaiah 35, verses 5 and 6. But what's unique about that is verse 4 of Isaiah 35 says, Behold, your Lord is coming to save you. Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus sends him the word, and it's the word that prevailed in John's life. 
And obviously John was martyred, he was beheaded, but he went to his grave knowing that he paved the pathway as John the Baptist, as the Elijah that was to come prophesied in Malachi. He paved the way for the true Messiah. And so John probably died in peace, even though he was martyred. And so we have to go through hard times. We have to go through rocky places to build character. Um, great athletes. Don't become great athletes overnight. The talent will take you so far, but the person that trains the hardest, the person that puts themselves through adverse situations, is usually the athlete that comes out on time. If everybody got a trophy, then why train? Why train? And what you find out, the reality of the situation is not everybody gets a trophy. You're going to find somebody at work that doesn't like you. You're going to get into a situation where things are tough, where money is short, where you have a fight. Let me tell you, as a preacher, I have a great week, six days a week. The moment I want to preach a sermon on that seventh day on Sunday, guess when my time gets tough? The times get tough on Sunday morning. Something happens. Something breaks down. Somebody's going to call and complain about something. It's the way it is. But, uh, but you learn how to get through that, and you learn how to stay focused on Christ in the tough times, in the rocky places. So the next place the Word of God fell was on the thorns. Worries and deceitfulness and desires for this world began to rob the people who heard the Word of their joy and of the Word they had in them. It's, it's people who lose focus. These are the people that come to God quickly, and then something goes wrong. And then they begin to blame God like it's his fault. Um, this is the number 17 people. We were in number 16 last week. We're in number 17 this week. And so the people were grumbling. And Paul even addresses this in 1 Corinthians 10.10. 10. He says, don't grumble in adverse times. And this was written for our benefit, for an example for us, that in tough times not to grumble, but to focus on Jesus Christ. And so what, what Moses does here. As he says, all of you tribes that are here, and there were 12 tribes, all of you bring your staff to the tent of meeting, light your incense, and basically this is saying, bring all your solutions to me. Bring all your ideas to me. Bring all your leaders to me, all your cultures to me, all your education, your fame, your science, your wealth, your positions. Bring all these things to me, and we're going to put it up with the staff of God. The staff represents the Word of God. And the staff that Aaron carried uh, didn't hide in Goshen when all the rest of, uh, when all the plagues happened in Egypt. He didn't hide in Goshen. The staff that Aaron had was the staff that Moses carried into every plague, every situation, every confrontation with Pharaoh. So this staff had seen the snakes, it had seen the lice, it had seen the frog, it had seen the bloody river, it had seen all these, the hail that came down out of heaven and destroyed things. This staff was experienced. And what happened is that staff did not allow the desires of the world to destroy. So that staff, what it did was it sprouted, it budded, it blossomed, and it produced fruit. It didn't lose focus. This is what this is about. Don't lose focus. Focus on God. Come to Christ. His staff, His word, specifically, His power will prevail. And so don't, don't lose focus, don't grumble. Um, every other solution to life's problems will fail in the long run. The only solution that will stand is the Word of God. Actually, Isaiah 55, 11 says that God's Word will never return to Him void. It will accomplish what it set out to accomplish. It will persevere. It will win in the end. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. The creation of the world in Genesis 1, 1 was created by the Word of God. He spoke the world into existence. And so God's Word will prevail amongst every man's solution. Every uh, institution that raises itself over the Word of God will eventually fail, only to find that the Word of God will stand forever. And so then, uh, the final soil was the good soil. And I like to look at this at our time. This good soil um, is the, the experienced soil. That's why I said I don't believe that this was the first time this soil, or this sower, had ever gone out to sow the Word. He was sowing on a pathway. It had to be there for a while. He was sowing in some rocky soil. And uh, he was sowing where some thorns had been. And now he's sowing in good soil. This soil is experienced soil. This soil had overlooked tradition. It had been through hard times. 
and it wouldn't allow the distractions of the world, the desires of the world, the forms to choke out the hope they had within them. This is the people that I believe, and that I think that are very, very valuable to the church. And I say this because these are the people that have been married. They've endured hardships. They've been through tough times. They've been through plagues. They've been through death, but they've endured the, the test of time. These are people that are very valuable in the church, mature believers who have applied the word of God, who have grown roots in adverse times, who have overlooked tradition and followed Jesus Christ. One pastor told me one time that people over 65 are culturally insignificant to the church. And I want to say that's an absolute false statement. An absolute false statement. These are the good soil people. These are the people that are, are here to help the young believers get through tough times. And you can look at this 30, 60, and 100. You had three bad soils. Now you got three, three results, three fruits, um, three percentages of gain. I think we could look at 30 and say, that's not enough. So then we'll go and we make it 60. But we change our ways. We get through tradition. We go through some hard times. And what we find is we start producing 100%. When you build strong believers that overcome tradition, cling to the Word of God, they go through adverse times, disease, famine, moving, bankruptcies, health issues, uh, marriage challenges, um, and then these people that go through thorny places where people try to distract them from the Word. The devil will throw every temptation at you. And actually, uh, Ecclesiastes says there's no temptation new to man. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says there's no there's no temptation, nothing new under the sun that we haven't already gone through since the beginning of time. So these are people that have gone through those tough times. They look past tradition. They've been through persecution. They've, uh, they have an eternal perspective, more importantly. They have learned that God's, worth, God's word wins every time. And in this situation, I think we could ask ourselves um, a couple of questions. And this is what I would close with. What are we learning in this situation? Are we learning that we're strong? Are we learning that we cling to the promises of God? Are we learning uh, about our perspectives, that it's easy to be distracted during this time? What are we learning about ourselves? What are we learning about others in this time? And I think what you'll find is that even though God doesn't necessarily pull us out of this situation, we'll find if we know His Word, and we'll find He's in this situation with us regardless. And we'll start to look around and see what He's doing. And as I did that, I started to look and see that we're a small church in Hillsboro, and we have about 80, 75 to 80 people on any given Sunday. But during this time, this little church has reached Puerto Rico, California, Florida, northern Ohio, Minnesota, Canada with the Word of God. Something that we could step back and say, I may not like it when it first happened, but I'm learning that God is in this situation and, and He is spreading the Word even through adversity. So I want to close with this thought, and I'm going to read this from 2 Corinthians 4, 18. If I can get that without getting blown away. Oops, sorry. 2 Corinthians 4, 18. Oh, my. 2 Corinthians 4, in verse 8 specifically, says this. We are hard, pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but never abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus Christ. That's identity with his death, persecution, and resurrection. So that the life of Jesus may be revealed in our body. In other words, when people see you, they see Christ. And hopefully they're seeing him through you in this situation. And then Paul moves on to say <clears throat> um, that, his, that in verse 16, Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far, far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. That means we stay focused on Christ. We fix our eyes on Christ. It far outweighs this temporary and momentary affliction. And actually, in John, Jesus talks about uh, a mother being in birth pain. Right now, we're in birth pain. Well, mother, after she sees her child, says, it was worth every minute of it. One day, we're going to see Christ. We're going to say, everything we went through.
here on this earth was was worth every minute of persecution or hard time we experienced. And so that's the thought I want to leave you with, to have an eternal perspective, to focus on Christ, to know that all that we go through is worth it. Knowing also that there are examples in the Bible where people went through hard times. Jesus did not take people out of their situations. In their valleys, he was there. In the fire, he was there. In the storm, he was there. He didn't take them out, but he walked with them and brought them through the hard times. And by the way, I want to think, when we were in the military, being a map reader, we learned one thing uh, that was very important, that in a valley, in almost every single valley, I would say every valley, there was a stream. So if you needed water, you needed a place to get cool, you needed something to drink, you find yourself down into a valley and look for the stream. And Jesus is the water of life. He said he will bring water, uh, fountains of living water out of us if we just stay with him. And so we can't expect God to come in and just remove this situation, but we can and know, expect and know that he is with us in this situation. Again, Daniel 3, he was with the Hebrew children in the fire. Uh, Mark 11, or uh, Matthew 11, he sent the word to John the Baptist to be an encouragement to him. And in the storm, in Mark 4 and 6, Jesus didn't take the disciples out of the storm. He was building character and perseverance in them. He was building trust with them. He didn't take them out of the storm. He was with them in the storm. And the reason Jesus was sleeping in the one account, because he knew his father was powerful enough to protect him in the storm. And in these storms, he's powerful enough to protect us as well. So let's keep an eternal perspective. Know that Jesus is with us in this situation. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. And the word that was in the beginning is with us now and will always prevail. Have a great day. I'll talk to you. Love you all. Bye.